How Coral Restoration Fails to Save Reefs Coral reefs' incredible value and productivity derive from their immense biodiversity. Reefs are the most diverse ecosystems on the planet, inhabited by more than 8 million species. The high level of species diversity and genetic diversity makes reefs resilient, or able to withstand disturbances and threats. When conditions on the reef are favorable, the corals grow well and support all the other reef life. Then, in a hot summer, the waters may exceed the normal growing threshold, causing some corals to become stressed. Corals less tolerant to temperature fluctuations will bleach, and many will die. But because of species and genetic diversity, many corals survive and the reef can continue to function. But it has lost corals during that event, which will take decades or even centuries to grow back, and the next hot year may be just around the corner. So coral restoration is needed to expedite growth and maintain the environmental and economic services provided by the ecosystem. A reef manager might see that some corals survived the bleaching event and decide that something about that coral's DNA makes it unique. So they take that coral and ones like it to create their restoration feedstock. Back at the nursery, they asexually propagate the coral by breaking it apart. Asexually derived fragments can be mounted to create daughter colonies. The process is repeated and the single donor coral taken from the reef can yield tens, hundreds, or even thousands of new colonies. Coral nurseries are cheap and easy to build, and the corals will survive well here under human care. After several months to a year, they will be large enough to transplant back to the reef. Because the corals are already large and healthy, they tend to survive well in the short term. Reef managers can see that they have increased the abundance of corals on the reef, and they can report their success to get more funding to carry on creating more corals. But while creating clones through asexual reproduction is cheap and easy, it does not create resilient reefs. Instead, it limits genetic and species diversity. The reef technically has more corals, but now it's suffering reproductive failures, inbreeding depression, and genetic bottlenecking. While corals were chosen for tolerance to temperature, all the other various threats on the reef were ignored. But maybe the next threat is something else, like a disease. The monocropped reef full of clones has no genetic variability to leave survivors following the disease epidemic. A mass die-off event ensues. With the corals lost, their associated fish and invertebrates disappear. The lack of grazers allows macroalgae to flourish, further impacting the few remaining corals. Over time, the ecosystem slides further and further into a new state. A phase shift has occurred from a productive and diverse coral reef to a less valuable and less diverse macroalgal ecosystem. Like too many others, the reef is lost forever. But it didn't have to be this way. Let's rewind. Instead of limiting the genetics of restoration feedstocks by selecting a coral that did well during the last problem and then cloning it, what if they focused on maximizing diversity? Reef managers can regularly collect corals of opportunity and unsecured recruits and use them to fill their nurseries. Or they can create feedstocks through coral spawning programs so that every coral in their nursery is a unique genetic individual. They can even selectively breed corals to increase genetic diversity further. By coupling these species and genetically rich corals with other methods of structural and physical restoration, they can create biodiverse reefs better prepared to withstand whatever the future may hold. At Conservation Diver, we are creating the next generation of marine conservationists. Our goal is not to simply restore the reefs of the past, but to create the reefs of the future. Follow us for more.